Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What a great more than the score crowd we have here this morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, who's going to the game? Woo! And bring back a win, okay? <laughs> How about our basketball team, the men's and the women's? 101 scored by the women. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Um, we have one remaining more than the score after this one for you. We hope you're signed up for it. Uh, William Epling in the engineering school will be speaking about cars and their emission systems. So you'll want to join us for that. Um, welcome to our in-person and also welcome to our at-home audience on the live stream today. We're glad you're here. Uh, to learn more about the um, Lifetime Learning programs, go to our website. Uh, there are virtual programs and then also in-person programs, engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. Um, during the Q&A portion of the, of the uh, program, there'll be two microphones passed around. Please speak directly into the microphone. That'll help our AV team out and those at home to hear us really well. And please limit your question to just one question and a brief question. Thank you. Now we are thrilled. Well, before I say that, go ahead and power down your phones. Go ahead and uh, put it on silence for you. We're thrilled to welcome Mallow Hudson, Dean and Edward E. Elson, professor in the UVA School of Architecture. He's nationally and internationally recognized expert in the areas of community development, climate resilience, and environmental justice and, and urban health. He is recipient of numerous awards, fellowships, including the Salzburg uh, Global Fellowship, two Mellon Fellowships, and a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Scholar Fellowship, among others. He served as tenured professor at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia University, and director of the Urban Planning PhD program and the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab. Based on his expertise, Dean Hudson uh, was invited to participate in Obama's administration's White House Forum on Environmental Justice. He has advised the Pew Charitable Trust and several other community-driven projects. Hudson received his PhD in urban and regional uh, planning from the School of Architecture and Planning at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He earned his Bachelor's of Art in Sociology and Master's, uh, Master of City Planning degrees from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, so the question that I'll leave um, Dean Hudson with today is if you'll you know, share with us a little bit about the goals you have for the architecture school. He's new, he's only been here for about two years now. So welcome Dean Hudson. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that great introduction. And I have to say, thank you for having such a, you all showing up, what a wonderful crowd and a lively crowd, I like that. So I had a chance to, <coughs> Get a, go to various tables and meet people, and I tell you, one of the great things about being at an institution like UVA is the family of UVA. Um, you know, so many of you have wonderful lived experiences, you've come from different walks of life, and you're all part of supporting this great university, and more importantly, what I want to talk about is when you think about a place like the University of Virginia, and you think about President Ryan's goal of being great and good, um, you, you definitely exemplify that, and I would tell you, being the Dean of the School of Architecture, uh, when you hear about the work that our faculty, our students, our alumni are doing, you will also understand why we feel like we're also great and good and contributing to the broader mission of UVA. <clears throat> what I wanted to do, I, I know you asked of, of our broader goals, I'll, I will tell you a little bit about what we're focusing on at the school, but I want to start off by telling you my own personal narrative of how I ended up here today. Uh, don't worry, it'll only be about two hours long. No. <laughs> kidding, kidding. Uh, at, the, at the school, we do have five priorities, uh, and they're not in any particular order of importance. They're all very important to us, but one is really around climate justice and climate resilience, and I obviously I'm going to talk about that today. 
another area is around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so it's thinking about how do we get uh, the best and brightest students, faculty, staff, the talent to come to Charlottesville and be at UVA, whether you live in Southwest Virginia, the informal settlements of Mumbai, or the south side of Chicago. We want you at UVA. We want you to contribute to the knowledge. We want you to ask the critical questions. And we, more importantly, we want you to take this great education and go out and have an impact in the world. A third area that we're focused on is making the school accessible and affordable. I can tell you without a doubt, having met so many students and their parents already, hundreds and hundreds of students and their parents, they are so selfless. When I first arrived last year, I stood in line and met uh, students as they got dropped off and their parents, and, they said, and I said, well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to uh, go to the Global South and work with biomaterials to build housing for those who don't have housing. Oh, I want to go and work on water systems for people who ha don't have clean water. And it only took me about four or five students in a row before my mouth just dropped open. These are students that you have to understand just went through COVID. These are students who have seen the cost of living skyrocket, the cost of having a house, the cost of starting their careers being so challenging, and not to mention the demands to get into top universities like UVA. And instead of them thinking about what's in it for me, they're saying, what can I do to be at this great university to give back to the world? And so if that's not enough to keep me motivated, uh, then I don't know what is. So whenever I'm feeling down or I read the newspaper, all I have to do is turn to our great students, and there's a number of them today. So the students in the School of Architecture, please raise your hand, not to embarrass you. Uh, <laughs> see, the teacher in me always comes out. And I have a number of just alumni, uh, faculty who are here today, uh, friends of, of the A School, and I just want to thank you all for being here. It makes a huge difference. The fourth area that we're focusing on is around faculty and staff excellence. Uh, one thing you'll understand, you've been coming to more than the score lectures. I mean, some of you are diehard. You have not missed one, which is highly impressive to me. Uh, you understand the breadth, the depth of the kind of intellectual questions and research that's, being, that's happening here at UVA. You understand the quality of our faculty. You understand the quality of our staff. I mean, in the back table, I've met staff members who have been here 20, 30 plus years dedicated to this great institution, making it what it is today. And so for us and for me as a dean of the School of Architecture, it's about supporting our wonderful faculty. We have several at the table here. Uh, and making sure that they can do the things that we talk about, of being this great and good university, of, of, of having an impact in the world. And then our last thing is uh, at Campbell Hall, we're tucked away right, on, uh, right behind Cars Hill, President Ryan's home. But we're on arts grounds, and so what we want to do is create a complimentary building that would be on Rugby Road. I won't get into all the details to bore you, but this complimentary building will really be called the Center for Design. And the idea is that we can partner with other great schools across UVA and departments such as engineering, uh, commerce, Darden, Batten, law, you name it, but in really to be engaged and also to have flexible classroom space one of the things about the way we teach is that much of our work is group work. It's interactive. It, it requires that deep engagement. And so how do we have students from uh, you know, different backgrounds, different perspectives, engaging with our faculty to really come together? So those are our five big priorities, among many other things that we're doing. Am I too loud? Yep. OK. All right, so a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Southern California from humble beginnings. My mother had me at 17 years of age. I'm the oldest. And you know, my mom said, one of the things I want you to do is always make a difference in the world. She didn't tell me to go be a doctor. She didn't tell me to go be a lawyer. She didn't tell me to be an engineer. She just let me kind of chart my own path. She was strict, very strict about school. Um, but she always said, you know, I'd come home, oh, I got A's, or I did this, that's fine. What are you doing to make a difference? I did this, that's fine, but what are you doing to make a difference? She, I watched her work as a nurse her whole life. Uh, she worked nights. She worked in geriatric care. I saw how she had the compassion and empathy for others. And she really passed that on to my sisters and I. And having grown up from humble beginnings, I lived in many different places. So the built environment shaped me early on of understanding, well, why, as not having a reliable car, was public transportation so important? And I can tell you, growing up in Southern California, a place that's car-centric, it was very difficult to get around. 
Uh, there were times, and I'm going to be very personal here, we had to go early in the morning to go to the grocery store and fill our cart up and push the cart home. And we'd go so early so I wouldn't be embarrassed. And all of those things shaped who I am today. And so when I went off to college, uh, I was certainly concerned about the built environment, poverty and inequality, but more importantly, thinking about health equity, thinking about communities, and why when you live in one particular community, or as we say in public health, you think about a zip code, why does your zip code matter so much for health and opportunity? Right? And so that's really shaped me. I, I went off to MIT, and from there, for those of you familiar with Boston, there's the Longwood Medical and Academic Area. It's really like the hospital, uh, sort of city within the city. And I saw surrounded by Brigham and Women's Hospital, one of the most fantastic hospitals in this country, Mass General Hospital, all these different wonderful places. Uh, not far from there were communities that were struggling. You could go across Huntington Avenue, right across from Harvard Medical School, into public housing, and you would see the levels of violence, infant mortality, uh, all diabetes, you name it that we often say you would find in other, either developing or in the global south, right, countries, right in Boston, Massachusetts. So all of this shaped me. I will fast forward a bit to then becoming a professor, really focusing at the intersection of how the built environment, housing, transportation, schools, the basic things that we take for granted but are so critical for our day-to-day -day lives shape us. And uh, I was at Berkeley for 10 years. Then I went to Columbia University. And uh, I was really recruited to go to Columbia because Columbia said, look, we're in the middle of Harlem. There's so much happening in New York right now in terms of housing costs and people struggling just to survive, thinking about health equity, maternal health, many things. So when I was there, I was fortunate enough to be a part of an initiative by President Bollinger that was called Columbia World Projects. And the idea was to take everything from humanities to the medical school and to create teams, so the great faculty that we have like at UVA, we find the faculty there or other institutions, and to take the research and scholarship to apply it to real world issues. So some of the things, I won't get into all the details, but we had things that were ranging from maternal health, working with six states, the Commonwealth of Virginia was one of them, but building a decentralized wastewater treatment facility in the Black Belt of Alabama, where when it rains too much, you can imagine, we're, you're eating breakfast, so I won't get into details, but you can imagine. You can imagine. That's working with the University of Alabama, University of South Alabama, Auburn, Georgia Tech, and, and some other great institutions. And then we had a project that was looking at carbon uh, sequestration, so taking carbon out of the air and exploring the option of could you suck carbon out of the air and put it in basalt rock off the coast of Canada. Uh, and so that was, a that was one of the projects. So there are many things we're working on, fantastic. Then I get a wonderful call to come to the great University of Virginia. And I said, well, I'm very happy. You know, at the time, as, as Provost McGill said, I'm very happy in New York and doing great things. And uh, they said, well, why don't we just have a conversation? And it took all of two minutes. I mean, I knew many great colleagues. I had great colleagues at Columbia from UVA. I had great colleagues at Berkeley from UVA. When I was at Berkeley and Columbia, we always took UVA students for grad school, always. Um, but I started to look at our faculty and the work they were doing was off the charts. The quality of the work, the values that were built into the work, the kind of impact they were having in the world, and you all know what the leadership is like here with President Ryan, with Provost Balcom now, and others, and just thinking about what is the role of the 21st century university? Why are you here on a Saturday morning, on game day of all things, you all are a special group of people to show up to hear a lecture from a dean of the School of Architecture, right? You're probably like, this is a snoozer, if you, but you're here because you're so committed. But the point is, UVA in its DNA has always been about making a difference, right? Given the past leaders that we've had here and the kind of impact that we've had here in the world, um, uh, it's just, it says a lot. So I give you that background because it's so much about who we are as a School of Architecture and to give you some context, even saying the School of Architecture, no disrespect to my architecture colleagues, but we have four outstanding departments. Architecture, landscape architecture, architectural history, which is the oldest in the country right here at UVA, and then we have urban environmental planning, and we have a number of other degree programs, so a massive urban design, a real estate development and design program, 
and we also have a historic preservation program. So there's not much we don't offer. We can't do everything, but what we do is really the continuum of thinking about scale, thinking about um, regions and territories, and thinking about who needs to be at the table when you think about some of the most complex issues in the world. Now, one of the things I, I will say is, you know, four years ago, I was invited to the UN, to the Secretariat General's office for an invite-only meeting to talk about climate and where we are. And it was the top scientists, it's everything you hear now, all those people were there, including the many of the big development banks, Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, all the people with the money. And it was a somber mood because we got the data. They had been running the analysis and they said, we're in trouble. It's what we, you all have been hearing, but it's the real deal of what's going on. And they said there's four things that we must do. We must change our production system right away. We must change our energy system right away. And two things that were incredibly important to me where I just stood up in my, you know, sat up in my chair was regional planning and local land use planning were the other two things. Regional planning and local land use planning. Now, we know the Parises, the Londons, the Los Angeleses of the world are trying to do a lot. But it's the tens of thousands of small to medium-sized cities that need to change the way they operate. So think of the Charlottesvilles of the world that are critical for this, right? So we are living in a place and sit sitting in a place right now that is so critical for this. And I know oftentimes it seems overwhelming, but actually it is the tens of thousands of cities. It's literally what we talked about that are needed to change the way we design and develop to have a big impact in the world if we're going to be serious about addressing climate change. So regions and scales are incredibly important. And then for us, it's methods, right? So thinking about policy, design, fabrication, cultural scholarship. You know, I do work in Chile, and one of the things that you talk to people who have been lived in disaster-prone areas, you say, just move, right? People say, just move. Well, you go talk to someone, you say, my family have been here for 200 years, sometimes 300 years. We are tied to this land. It means something to us. It's not just a place to live. It is part of who we are. And so these are different conversations you have to have and say, well, how can we think about being more resilient, thinking about design and mitigation and so forth? So you, you all get that. But we have faculty, for just to give you a few examples, that are working on robotic fabrication systems to study how utilize waste from the temp to utilize waste from the timber industry, which I'll talk more about in a minute. We have faculty who are using wave simulation tools to study rising currents and waterways across the globe. You know, Water is a huge issue here in the Commonwealth. And faculty who are working with planning offices in southwest rural Virginia, counties to build flooding resilience plans. So we're doing a lot. Um, the two images you see behind me, one on the left is, is Norfolk region, and the one on the right is the Great Lakes region. And we're working in both those areas in, in terms of thinking about, again, just the type of scale that we're doing. So when we think about coastal resilience, um, this first project, I unfortunately can't talk about all the great stuff that we're all doing, but uh, this first project, enhancing resilience in equity in urban coastal communities. This is a new $5 million National Science Foundation grant awarded to two of our faculty, their co-PIs. So Professor Phoebe Chrisman in architecture and Professor Ginny Rowe, who's in urban environmental planning. And they're focused on the Norfolk region, an area that is dealing with the, some of the most challenging flooding issues, as you all know. And in this collaboration, it's not just with the A School, it's across grounds, which is beautiful. So they're partnering with UVA's Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies, the School of Engineering, and the Department of Environmental Sciences, right? Just speaks to UVA's greatness of just all of those groups working together to think about flooding in the Norfolk region. And more importantly, they're not just working here at UVA, they've also partnered with Norfolk State University. So Professor Chrisman will lead the design of resilience projects with three Norfolk communities over the next five years. And this work already uh, builds on her current research for the past 18 years, where she's been leading numerous sustainable architecture, public art, and coastal resilience projects in the Hampton Roads region, including the Learning Barge, Paradise Creek Nature Wetland Learning Lab, and River Academy. So you can see the kind of depth and experience that professors are bringing to the table. And then Professor Rowe, Professor Ginny Rowe, who's in urban environmental planning, will lead a health and well-being well benefits analysis of green and gray infrastructure 
developed in Norfolk as part of this project. Uh, Professor Rowe will draw on unique protocols established elsewhere in the world and bring this methodology to the United States for the first time. She will be connecting the impacts between green spaces and positive mental health and for the quality, improving people's quality of life. So think about that. Making that connection, which we all know now after COVID, but Professor Rowe's been working on this for years, right? And so she's been on the cutting edge in this area. And the team will explore co-development, not only of the built, in cap built capital, like infrastructure, but also really thinking about the human capital, right? Thinking about connections, resources, technology tools that will empower leaders, but also local citizens to, to do work together in tackling climate change challenges in their own environment over the long term. So for us, you'll see a, a significant approach to our work is that we really think about co-production. Because yes, we bring certain knowledge and expertise to the table, certain tools that we know, certain methods that we know, but no one can tell you about your local community unless you actually live there. And so it's important for us to, to co-produce this knowledge, to co-design some of our projects, and, and, we, and planning really emphasizes this. But I just want to read a quote from our professors. For communities to feel ownership in that future, in the infrastructure investments that play a role in their envisioned future, they must be co-participants co in the design process. And so again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about if you go to a place that might be disaster prone, you have to talk to people about their lives. And if we're thinking about redevelopment or future development, they have to be at the table and, and have a say so. That's it. This is very critical for us. And then I'm going to jump down and tell you a little bit about the third project <coughs> listed here, preserving coastal parklands. So this is funded by the US Car Army Corps of Engineers. It's a collaboration of our faculty in landscape architecture, so Brian Davis, Aaron Fatalik, Michael Lugering, and also our, one of our top PhD students. We have great PhD students, and, and Marintha Dawkins is one of them that's working. And they're in partnership with the National Park Service, the Nature Conservancy, ETZ strategies, and the overall part of this project is really thinking about how do you design, develop, and test uh, nature and natural-based features. So thinking about what matters the most for uh, preserving, either addressing some of the coastal flooding, how do you create better coastal parklands, and they're working on three areas that you might know well. Colonial, historic, uh, Colonial National Historic Park, the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historic Park, and uh, 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 Asateague Island National Seashore. So are some of you familiar with any of those places or have been there? Yeah, I see a lot of head shaking. So, so they're, they, they are doing work there. And as you all know, I see you shaking your heads, these are very different landscapes, right? And so what they're trying to understand is how these different landscapes represent a range of issues that the national coastal parks are facing. More importantly, they're getting calls from across the country of saying, we're dealing with the same things, whether it be in California, whether it be in the southern part of the United States, or even around the Great Lakes region. So you have our faculty doing work. And the nice thing about this, the team is working on natural alternatives to flood control and other landscape management needs. And uh, their work is part of the National Park Service's planning for a changing climate guide that encourages parks to think creatively about climate adaptation, approaches that incorporate a blending of science-based management strategies with cultural resilience. So it really is taking the science, the culture, community knowledge, and putting it all together. Uh, furthermore, along coastal resilience, we have uh, our, some of our faculty are using emerging technologies, uh, such as that developed by our chair of landscape architecture, uh, Professor Brad Cantrell. And he has a dynamics ter ter uh, terrain uh, collab, which involves the design and construction of a geomorphology table which uses advanced technology to model hydrological profiles for major rivers across the world. So in layman's terms, because I'm speaking here, you're like, what does all this mean? It it's, might be hard to see in the back, but it's actually a table that's quite long and large, and they run water through it, and they could see how rivers either you know, shape themselves, what, if you flood it, what happens. And what they're really interested in is the sediment, the flow of the sediment, and thinking about how all of this might in, uh, affect the delta size. And so they're taking these baby models and then applying it to the broader real world. And so these uh, geomorphology tables are fantastic. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, as, as you can see, and it's, it's hard with the light, but we have a lot of different models and wonderful things in the A school. 
And so my children, they know I'm the dean of the School of Architecture, but for them, they're like, what does that mean? And finally, I took them into the building. They had a chance to go into our fabrication lab to see the geomorphology table and some of the other things I'm going to talk about. And now they think it's one of the most interesting things. They're like, okay, now I can see it and touch it. Now this is cool. So thanks to my colleagues, they've given me the cool factor um, with my children. So I, I, I'm going to ride that wave for a long time. Um, another area that we're focusing on is the Coastal Futures Hub. So this is another $5 million pan-university research grant supported by the National, Fa National Science Foundation. And this time it's focused on rural coastal communities of Virginia's eastern shore. So you see the pattern here. It's really making sure that we're engaged with many different communities, different types of geographies, and so forth. This project is led by our Environmental Resilience Director, Karen McClathery, who is absolutely fantastic. If you don't know Karen, uh, she would be, I don't know if she's spoken in the past, I'm sure she has. Uh, just a wonderful colleague and a great person who's so committed. Uh, it has colleagues from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, from Engineering, from UVA's Biocomplexity Institute, from the Institute of, uh, uh, or for IEN, which is in our own uh, school, the Equity Center, William and Mary, and also Old Dominion University. I believe we have some guests from who live in, William, uh, who live in Williamsburg. So uh, yes, they're right over there. So that's great. So. We're, see, UVA's even in, in your backyard, which is wonderful. So you can be proud to wear your UVA stuff around with, knowing that we're partnering together. So, uh, but this project includes work uh, by Tanya Declan Cobb, who's the director of IEN and a professor in urban and environmental planning. And also our professor, wonderful professor, Barbara Brown Wilson, who is uh, the faculty director also of the Equity Center. And she is developing the, a climate equity atlas for the region with residents and community member, members, right? So they're thinking about the importance of access, public access to data, which is incredible. So if you're a homeowner and you're thinking about what are the risks of flooding and all, like sh they can find out all this different information for you, right? Through, by thinking about getting this data, democratizing the data, so everyday citizens have access to that. That's incredibly important when you think about what are the risks, right? You've all dealt with, I, I have the, whether it's the fortunate thing or the unfortunate thing being married to an attorney. And I tell you, she gets to know all of our insurance agents quite well. And one day we had some flooding, and they argued for, I don't know, must have been like two hours about whether the water came through the window or underneath the door. Apparently it doesn't matter. I just wanted to know, are we going to get a check or not? So uh, we got the check. She, I think they gave up. They're like, we're tired of arguing. So um, Barbara, with her equity atlas and working with colleagues, thinking about data equity. And that's something I'll come back to and maybe in the question and answer period. But Taking all of this data, I know, you know some of the words I'm using are, are, are our own technical terms, but when you think about who's being impacted, what are the risks, how do we share that information and work with community to really make a difference? So that's incredibly important. And we're not just doing it within the A school, but across grounds and with our other great colleagues at other institutions. Okay, and, and we also are thinking about our curriculum, right? I can't, we can't do this work without our great students. I talked about them earlier and some are here today. But coastal resilience is integrated in a part of what we are doing and what we're teaching. And there's so many classes. So it's like, it's like everything. You can't separate it out. It's part of who we are, right? It reminds me when I first started the work around health equity. People would say, but why are you working on health? And you're thinking about the built environment. It's not separate. And we all know this, right? It's all interconnected. And so that's what we're trying to teach our students. And so a current example here uh, is our advanced research studio course taught by Marantha Dawkins and Will Shivers. These are our PhD students. And they're asking students to study the effects of climate change on the US Virgin Islands. Students are looking at the design of community centers for hurricanes, cooling centers for rising temperatures, and new sustainable models for tourism. I wanna stop here for a minute because when you think about the heat island effect, whether we're talking about Phoenix, Arizona, or we're talking about Chicago, uh, our big cities, you know, I see people shaking that. You saw what happened in Europe this summer. You saw what's happening across the globe. Temperatures are rising. And so how do we cool down those temperatures within cities? How do we address that uh, from a broader perspective? And then on another note, when you think about models for tourism, you say, well, why would that matter? Well, I'll tell you. A few years back, I was invited to go to um, uh, Colombia, the country. And when I went there, I went to one of the Manizales, which is one of the most lush, green, beautiful, coffee-growing regions of Colombia. And when I started to go there, I had never seen horses starving. I saw their ribs, and I asked my colleagues, what's going on? And they said, well, the conventional farmers have come in, 
and they bought out these this land from the local farmers that grew the coffee, uh, and and they they rotate their crops, and now it's just one type of crop. It's conventional. It's it's all bob you know blocked off by fences, and that's and so one of the things we're talking about is well, can we think about ecotourism? Can we think about other ways to bring the economy to people uh, that can can help them, and not just think about one economy? I think here in Virginia, I cannot sit up here as a dean of the School of Architecture and talk about designing for climate if we don't work with our friends and our families in Southwest Virginia. We just can't do it. It's one thing for me to say this in the great place of Charlottesville or from Nova or you know coming in from New York, that's wonderful. But how are you gonna tell someone who their whole economy has built, been built around one thing or a few things and they're seeing that go away? You've got to provide an alternative and you've got to engage. We cannot do that from Charlottesville. We've got to go engage. And we've got to figure out the future because those young people are depending on it. The people who live there are depending on it. And the state needs us to do that. And they need all of us to do that. So that's the kind of work our students, these are doctoral students leading these advanced research studios. They're doing it in the US Virgin Islands, but it's replicable and applicable to other places, right? And so that's, I know you're just like, he's passionate. Um, I, I am so happy with the work we do. And then, you know, I can't mention everyone, but also, with our Masters of Urban Design program, uh, Mona Al Al Kif, our, Al Kafif, our, our professor, she is weaving, her and her colleagues are weaving all of this into the curriculum of thinking about resilience, of thinking about climate, of thinking about, so it's happening. Okay, let me move on and, and I'll make sure it's staying, staying on time, so it's so far so good. Um, we think about materiality. I've been talking a lot about on a regional or more of a territorial scale, but what about the actual materials themselves, right? Some exciting things are happening at UVA around thinking about materials. So at a di very different scale, a number of faculty are working on multiple projects examining the materials we use in the design and construction industries. So low carbon alternatives, low waste or reuse of waste materials from industrial processes, natural or biomaterials. And, and this work is also testing both advanced and novel, novel fabrication tools and methods of traditional Oh, and also what we would refer to as vernacular architecture. So really thinking about vernacular architecture, really thinking about what's local, what materials are local to that particular region, what's necessary for the people who live there. And so really thinking about that, and that's incredibly important because when you look at waste, so much comes from the building industries, right? And so um, I taught a class in, uh, at Columbia where we looked at New York City and London, and I could just, the, the amount of waste is un unbelievable. Uh, so let me just give you a few examples of, of the material resilience work that our colleagues are doing. So there's a project called Tangential Timber. It's a research team led by assistant professors Katie McDonald and Kyle Schumann. And they are looking into the ways to invest and utilize what they have found to be 55% of harvested, harvested timber that is deemed unusable in construction due to irregularities, including trees raised from construction sites, or they're damaged or diseased uh, because of weather and so forth, they're actually figuring out how, what do we do with these materials, right? And you see up in your right hand, top right hand corner, these are different projects they're just playing with to say, well, what can we build with this timber? How long does it last? What's the stress it could take? To figure out maybe this is not waste. So they're, they're, they're using novel fabrication methods to test this out um, and to find alternatives to just discarding all of this material or shredding it into chips and pulp, which we do. Um, and this project recently won a National Research and Development Award from Architect Magazine. And I could tell you, I can't even keep up with our wonderful professors, um, Kyle Schumann and Katie McDonald, because they get so many awards. I wake up and check my email and they'll say, uh, Dean Hudson, I have something else to share with you. Uh, it's, but they just bring so much energy to the table. They think outside the box. This work is incredibly relevant, right? This, and it's, it's relevant for Virginia and it's relevant for everywhere you go. And then down in the right-hand corner, this is another professor who helps me have a cool factor with my children, is assistant professor Asan Barlow. And he's working with our engineering colleagues um, to study all additive manufacturing. So how to 3D print soil structures, right? So think about this for a minute. He's taking different soil structures, printing this into different structures, like thinking about small structures now, but eventually buildings. And can we use it for insulation? How long can it stay out in, in different weather? And why is this relevant when you think about disasters? And so I mentioned my work in Chile. 
you know earthquakes have happened in Haiti and elsewhere, and you, look, you go back five, 10 years later. Well, people get moved to temporary, so imagine you all temporary sites, temporary camps, and that those temporary camps, camps become long-term. I'm from California. You think about the fires that have happened over the last decade or so. And you go back and you talk to residents and they're still waiting for it to be rebuilt. So it's this type of thinking that says, okay, are there other ways that we can provide more biomaterial type of, using biomaterials to build housing, to do it faster, cheaper, uh, where it's healthy, it's good for the environment. These are the things we have to do. We have to break out of our old models. What I was saying before at the UN, our production system has to change. And it's these kind of things that our colleagues are doing that I think are going to be uh, quite relevant. So Professor Barlow and team and colleagues in engineering, they are testing how to combine these additive manufacturing materials, thinking about speed, cost efficiency, low energy demands uh, for this and how it can be resourced and so forth. And so um, this is down in our fabrication lab. He's got another huge robot over uh, near Seaville Coffee at Allied, and they're doing great work there. And then we're delighted to have another faculty member who's, who's joining us, Mohammed Ishmael. He's finished up his doctorate at MIT, and he's looking at low carbon structure systems. Um, and his, his dissertation research at MIT, which he's defending, I believe, in a week or so, so he's, he's studying hard. Uh, he's looking at low carbon, low cost structural concrete components for places like in, uh, in the global south. So sub-Saharan Africa is a big place, but how can we provide higher quality housing for people? When I was at Columbia, we had a, a climate meeting uh, as part of Columbia World Projects, and one of the things that people were saying is, well, if you look at Iraq, and you look what's happened to people in Syria and where they go, there are these camps for a long time, and, and from a national security perspective or an international security pr perspective, they said, what do you think happens to young people when they have no opportunity, they're living in a tent for three to five years and not going to school? That is all around an ecological and a human disaster for everybody. Uh, and so it's thinking about what can we do to support people? What can we do to work with local governments, the private sector, and so forth? I see the same thing in Chile, about three hours south of Santiago. They've had earthquakes, they've had floods, they've had fires, very similar climate, Mediterranean climate like California, and they're dealing with many of the similar things, and development takes a long time. All right, um, and then our students are doing similar work, so I won't get into a whole bunch on this, but they are also doing materials research. They're doing it in the fabrication lab. They're also doing it at Morvan Farm. So we have the Morvan Farm kitchen garden, uh, Milton Airfield and many other places. So you'll see our students all over the place and uh, doing great work. All right, so this is the last part I want to talk about is, uh, you know, we talked about coastal resilience. We've talked about materials for resilience, but then thinking about people and thinking about place and thinking about culture and thinking about identity and thinking about history, right? All of these things are incredibly important. We can't just talk about it from a, a scientific academic perspective. We have to think about the lived experience. And this is uh, designing for resilience. It's, it's not only just the scientific and technical, but it's also cultural, political, and as I said, the lived experience. But it's central to our work. Uh, we think about parks that we play in, cities and towns that we live in, buildings that we work in, uh, and there are lots of questions, uh, climate questions, that really touch on the social dimension. And so the image that you see here are from the Arctic Design Group. It's a research collaborative founded by professors Matthew Jewell and Lena Cho and the School of Architecture. You see me beaming with pride because we're such great faculty. Uh, this is from their most recent season. And Utkiavek, Ut 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 Alaska, I want to make sure I got that right, they are setting up instrumentation to test the environmental conditions in one of the most rapidly changing in extreme environments in the world, the Arctic. As a matter of fact, I looked up the city they're working in, I think today it's six degrees, right? And so you can imagine uh, how cold it really gets in the middle of winter. Their work is long-term work that is developed in collaboration with partners across the university and across institutions and government partnerships. In recent years, they have been awarded over $10 million through the National Science Foundation's Navigating the New Arctic Program, an area of investment uh, that they have defined as the 10 big ideas. So our colleagues are being funded by this kind of work as sort of under the 10 big ideas. 
The National Science Foundation is committed to supporting research that tackles convergent scientific challenges and the rapidly changing Arctic. And that's, this is the work uh, that Lena and Matthew are really engaged in. Their work examines uh, both the history and the future uh, of how to build in such harsh and fragile environment. And just to give you some context, uh, the Arctic region is warming at three times the rate of the global average, forcing significant adjustments to life on the North Slope, which they call it, from subsistence activities such as hunting and whaling to everyday habitation. So climate is changing for them in a rapid way. The city's infrastructure, water, sanitation, power, building and road stability is severely endangered because you now have this warming and then now the ground is changing with the permafrost. Uh, they already have a short construction season of less than two months uh, a year, and, and most of the building materials are barged in only once or twice annually. So there's, there's a sense of urgency in what needs to happen. So in, mo in the most recent years, this has become even more exaggerated on the fo frozen ground, um, and so our colleagues are, are really diving in. They are also working with the town's housing authority, the Boys and Girls Club, the local high school, uh, and it's really a community engagement effort. And I want to read just a quote from our, prof our colleague, Professor Matthew Jewell, to give you a sense of the kind of work that uh, he and Lena do. He says, our work in the Arctic is not short term. There is a long history of scientific research in this region being extractive. The indigenous peoples of Alaska and the National Science Foundation are aware of this and there is a necessary effort to centralize investment within communities through co-production and long-term community building. We are supporting local knowledge, local communities know that things are not as they were, that the environment is changing their lives and their landscapes. But by helping to set up sensors, by building a three-dimensional depiction of the ground, and by using technology to learn more about this adapt uh, adapting environment, we are providing access to valuable data, but the data is their data but the data is their data. So you have UVA faculty going to the northernmost part of Alaska and to the Arctic and engaging with the community and bringing their expertise and bringing them in to the process, the local residents in the process, because it changes their life. And through this work, they're able to also uh, help other places. And this is why the National Science Foundation is so invested in their work. This is why, as a dean, I'm so invested in their work. And to me, it speaks to the kind of things we should be doing in the 21st century. When you think about the 21st century university, yes, we should be providing a first-rate education to our students. We should be teaching at a high level. We should be doing all of our research. But also, we need to have impact. To me, that is what UVA stands for. That is what we all stand for. And it's projects like this that are just doing so much. Um, I've already read much, much of this, but you could see that. Another uh, piece that they're doing because the pandemic's finally over, we, th we say, we think, we can travel. I better not speak too soon. This will be a live on forever, right? It's like, ugh, I don't want to predict. But they're taking students to the Arctic studio, uh, in their Arctic studio. They're taking students to Alaska now, uh, this spring, to engage. So think about this. Not only are they doing the work, working with local communities there, working the Boys and Girls Club, working with the local high school and so many other institutions, they're now taking our fantastic UVA students that come from all walks of life and lived experiences there to engage. This is what makes me hopeful for the future. As I said, I know the news oftentimes about climate is, is depressing, I'll be honest with you. The data is not great. But when you see the kind of work that our colleagues are doing and taking our students there, it really is so important. So with that, let me just conclude by saying, um, you know, we're thinking across disciplines, as I said. We're thinking across scales. We're trying to engage on all these complex issues. And for us, it really is about climate transformation, right? Climate transformation is for us is what we have to do. And so I'm optimistic. And this spring, we will have a uh, climate transformation conference. It's open to all of you, of course. We will stream it as well if you can't, uh, if there's not space inside. But the idea is not to have a conference, that, a meeting that says, oh, everything's bad. We know everything's bad. We want to celebrate what we're trying to do and what we've been doing and what the solutions are and, and really focusing on this climate transformation. So with that said, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank those who are online that couldn't be with us today. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Hello? Yes. So, first of all, <laughs> you are amazing. <laughs> and then, because um, I think most people here are very educated. They have been thinking about these things for years and years, and you have put it all together in one hour. That's crazy. Um, but also, I want to say, um, do you know about certain things that are happening in Charlottesville right now in terms of flooding, East High, and how are you? How are you um, sort of thinking about like redesigning Charlottesville so yes. it makes sense? And then also, do you know who Pablo Zatz, IT director at Columbia University is? No, I have not met Pablo yet, but we'll talk. So, okay. about, so yeah. the question is, to paraphrase here, and I hope I get it right, is when we think about Charlottesville, we look at the flooding and the other climate challenges that we face, what's happening? How is A school approaching this and how is UVA approaching this? I will tell you one of the most important things you'll find from our colleague, from my colleagues, and why they're so wonderful and great, and we have the Chair of Urban Environmental Planning here, Suzanne Muma. She'll tell you this too if I'm lying. Our faculty are designing research projects that could be replicable and applicable. We're not trying to do things that get into a great journal and that no one ever understands what happens next. From our coastal resilience work to thinking about you know, social resilience and, and the dimensions of resilience, uh, how can it be replicable to other places? So I'm confident almost everything I've presented, probably everything I've presented, is relevant for Charlottesville. And it goes back to what I was saying that shape. I still remember that, that what it, you know, when I went to that UN meeting, um, I walked home. I went to walk back up to the Upper West Side of Columbia because I needed that time because it was so just having young children. My daughter's 11, my son's eight. I think I called my wife and I said, it's bad. From that point on, I mean, I've always been committed to these things, but it, from that point on, we, everything we do, can it be replicable? Is it applicable? Is it relevant? Now we understand the different community context, and we have not one size fits all solutions, but so our research is that. It won't get funded this day and age, and Professor Muma, correct me if I'm wrong, it just won't get funded today, unless it really has this dimension to it, this complexity to it. We have a group of students and faculty working in Richmond's called Urban Apartheid, looking at red line communities and the disparate impact of flooding and heat islands, et cetera. And over the years, we've had a number of faculty doing a similar sort of thing in Charlottesville. We will alternate. I have uh, a question online uh, that with my glasses I'll see. If, how, it says, how can we become more like Europe in supporting cycling to events, to events, to work, et cetera. As a cyclist in Loudoun County, Virginia, I've noticed people talk the talk, but do not walk the walk, so to speak. They are interested in cycling until it interferes with their driving routes, then aggressive driving, and the third finger prevails. I'm, hey, I just have to read it, I have to read it. Um, it's, actually, it's actually a great question. Um, it, the timing couldn't be better, but I am a co-PI on a, on a NSF grant, $26 million National Science Foundation grant that's looking at streetscapes, urban streetscapes. So Harlem, New Brunswick, and West Palm Beach, Florida. And what we're trying to figure out are, are there ways to change the streetscapes? So looking at data, like who's traveling by what modes of transportation? Who's taking the bus, who's driving, who's bicycling, who's you know, walking, all of the above. Um, so there has to be a conversation about how we want to get to work, how we're designing our cities in terms of, it's very difficult uh, if everything's spread out or the different uses are not together, so thinking about those things. But there's a lot of work being done on our streetscapes and uh, my colleagues and I are working on that. Also this past summer I was in uh, Denmark in Copenhagen and I think they're the most, I think they, if, if my data is correct, if there's someone from uh, Copenhagen today, but I believe they cycle three times around the earth a day. If you add up all the cyclists, everyone's riding a bike. But you look at the environment, right, and how they've invested uh, in bicycle lanes, how they've invested in safety, how they've used technology, how they've thought about culture. So it takes a lot to do that. I'm not saying we can't do it here. We can definitely do it here. Uh, but it takes a comprehensive uh, strategy. It, it takes working with our land use planners. It takes working with local 
land use lawyers, it takes working with community groups, and thinking about a different way of life for ourselves, right? And so that's really important. Questions? Other, I, I have other questions online if there aren't any popping up. people are, Don't be shy, you can ask me anything, uh, let's see. Uh, there's another one that says, uh, is it possible to inoculate politicians from the hard decisions that have to be made for communities in regard to common good and climate change and resilience? How else would someone be incentivized to get to, to, get to the best answer? So I think it's another uh, fantastic question in a sense of how do you work with local politicians, right? We think about the work I've described and the work that I'm sure many of you do, you know it's long term. And you know, as a dean and as a, as a leader at this university, I think universities have a critical role to play as a convener, right? So we have the opportunity to bring the different parties together, whether we're talking about the private sector, we're talking about community, whether we're talking about industry, you know, whatever it is, we can bring them together to be the convener. Maybe we can share our data, um, and I think it's important just to have the conversation, obviously try to go beyond that, but I think if you start to engage people and uh, again, the work that my colleague uh, Barbara Brown Wilson has been doing and others with their equity atlas work, the work at the equity center, the work that we're doing in the A school and our colleagues in engineering across grounds, there are many ways to engage and to share data with residents and let them be part of the process. I think it's very hard to a politician when they think about the constituents. If they say, if you are the voters and you are starting to demand these things, you'll see things change. I'll give you an example. In the state of California, uh, when there was Earth Day in the, in the school district of Oakland, California several years ago, they found out their asparagus was gr uh, grown in South America, flown to China for packaging, and then flown to the Bay Area to be consumed by children many days later, some 17,000 miles. And here we are in California talking about being sustainable, worried about the climate. We grow this right in the Central Valley of California. So why is it the system's broken? So what happened is you had people like Moira O'Neill, who's a professor in our department, uh, in full disclosure, also my wife, but she's a land use law professor at the law school here in urban environmental planning, helping to work with colleagues at the Center for Eco Literacy and with the state of California, and really having Cal an initiative called California Food for California Kids, which is saying, let's bring locally sourced food to our school system. It's not a big radical idea, it's common sense. Well. That grew from some, I believe some 87 schools. I get nervous when my wife's here because she's always like, you get it wrong. Some 87 schools. Anyway, the bottom line is it's spread all across the state of California. Republicans, Democrats, independents, everyone loves it because you're talking about supporting local farmers. You're talking about wage labor. You're talking about transportation. You're talking about health. You're talking about education. There's not much you're not talking about. Immigration, right? And so we're saying, can we do this better for everyone? And so there are ways to engage, and universities have been a big part of that effort in California. And I'm happy to say that uh, the Department of Education here in Virginia, along with UVA and the work that my colleagues Moira O'Neill and Jennifer Lawrence and so many other faculty here at UVA and at Virginia Tech are working to do a similar thing. They just had a meeting this week. So if you demand it, you can change the system. And so you have big traditional food manufacturers now saying, oh, is this what the state of California wants? Because that's a billion dollar plus industry. We will do what you need, right? It changed. And local farmers are saying, thank you. We have certainty now. You're buying 30,000 pounds of tomatoes from my farm to feed the kids across the state of California. Wonderful. You're buying Mary's free range chicken for all the kids. Wonderful. You're buying right, you know, you see the point. It's dollars are going back in the local economy. We're supporting the whole food system. We're supporting labor. We're supporting our children and hopefully uh, creating uh, healthier families and everything else. Okay, we have one inside. I, I didn't know how long I was gonna have to talk for. I was like, please. We've got an online question. Okay. Any research on placing solar panels on parking garages? This is being done in Great other question. countries. Great question. Well, you know, I know, I, I, you know, I'm not an economist, but uh, solar panels, the cost have gone, has gone way down. Technology's gone off the, so I, you know, I think it obviously matters the kind of sunlight you can get, but that, I see this happening in a lot of places, so I don't have the data on that right now, but I don't see why that's a real impediment. I think the big issue is the technology, who pays for it, and that sort of thing. I'm sure there's many smarter people out there that can answer that question than I can, better than I can, but it's doable. 
it, it's happening. I mean, you have Tesla saying they could put it on your homes, and I'm sure you know you have lots of, of uh, large companies wanting to change the way they do things. I think the bigger conversation, the solar panel one is great, but I think the bigger conversation we're asking now is, as we think about whether you're a large manufacturer or you are a university or you are some big institution, can we build in a different way that is more sustainable, that's using the biomaterials, that whether it's from Professor Barlow that I showed what's happening in the fabrication lab with his work, or the work of Professors uh, Katie McDonald and Kyle Schumann to think about other biomaterials and, and timber that we might be able to use, the, the discarded timber. Are there ways to build differently? And I would say yes, yes, yes. I think what we have to do is create a marketplace for it. We have to support it. It has to get off the ground. I mean, people laughed at electric vehicles many years ago, and now look. You're right. I mean, the state of California has just said by, by 2030, 2035, all cars must be electric coming out now. So it's happening. Oh, another question from uh, one of the online. Okay. Okay, here's a question that's kind of re relevant to the last. We are asking, we are adding so much technology to buildings to make them uh, green, more energy efficient. But there is also a way to simplify. But is there also a way to simplify making things more sustainable, so that continued uh, recommissioning is not required? So I think that the big question is, we obviously can't just keep building new. So are there ways to take the kind of housing stock or building stock that we have, and repurpose it and reuse it? Uh, again, I'm, uh, my wonderful colleague Suzanne Muma, who is heading up our real estate program here at UVA. A big part of the curriculum is around a re redactive reuse. And it's saying, can we take these older buildings? I mean, look at how beautiful University of Virginia is. Look what we've done with the rotunda. Look what we've done with our older buildings. We've made them nice and modern on the inside. We've tried to make them more energy efficient along the way, but we're retaining them. I was just in with uh, Dean John Unsworth, who's dean of the library. He had a Jeffersonian dinner on the built environment. This is why I love UV. He had a Jeffersonian uh, dinner on the built environment this past week and invited me over. And we're in this pavilion. And he was talking about how they've been so, UVA has been so meticulous in taking care of them, but also modernizing them, having central air and thinking about efficient windows and so forth. It's a, it's a challenge, and that's why we have historic preservation, architectural history. We have these different departments and, and programs to try to address these issues. But many, many opportunities to, to address some of the older buildings. In Copenhagen, I mentioned uh, this summer, we were staying in, it's the Villa Copenhagen, which is a five-star hotel, and it was the old U.S. Post, or U.S. Post, it was the old post office there for them, and they've renovated it. It's unbelievable how beautiful it is and how sustainable it is. Uh, but you have to be committed to that kind of thing, but you can do it. Okay, w one final question. All right. Um, we see with an environmental equity and, and also uh, equity in, I guess, planning our, our future economies. Uh, things that pop out to me is like uh, how the microchip, big investments are going to areas that already are doing fairly well in the economy with, uh, for example, Columbus, Ohio, as contrasted to the Rust Belt of Northeastern Ohio that still lags. Yeah. Focusing then on southeastern, southwestern Virginia, are, are there solutions? There seems to be a lag between uh, what the people want, uh, and this is demonstrated in West Virginia, where they're not changing as quickly, uh, is there a solution that you have found or that your, your uh, folks have found with the engagement in southwestern Virginia? Are there solutions that are starting to pop up to allow southwestern Virginia to uh, both be climate friendly and, and have yeah. the economies that would be yeah. So I will not uh, speak on behalf of my colleagues who are doing the real work, right? I'm, I'm giving you the narrative of what they've been doing, so I'll defer. I will tell you this. As someone who's worked and uh, under-resourced, under-invested in communities around the world, there's one commonality. I've never heard people say, you can't bring investment into my neighborhood or my community. We want to be at the table, right? So if you're going to come into my community and talk about the future, engage with us. In my experience, that's the most important thing. First and foremost, you must engage and listen to what people want, what they need, what they've gone through. The second thing is I've seen investment in infrastructure, but not investment in people. 
And I'm going to tell you right now, when you see investment in infrastructure and not the people, those people are not going to be there. So you cannot do that. If you're going to be a serious leader, if you're going to be a real, someone who's really about change, you have to invest in people. So I can tell you first and foremost, think about all those young people and those great young minds there. What future, futures are they interested in doing? Right? There's a lot of things that they could do, and so, but who's engaging? And who's listening to what the path has been in the, in the first place? How are we partnering with UVA Wise? How are we partnering with the local institutions? Right? So I've seen that everywhere I've gone. Whether we're talking about Colombia, whether we're talking about this, the, the southern part of Chile, or wherever, it's, it's the similar issue, or even you know, Central Valley of California, where there's not a whole lot of things. Investing in people, coming to the table as equal partners, and listening to what their needs are, and then trying to make that happen. But I can tell you, we're all very simple when it gets down to it, right? Education, access to food, access to shelter, support, care, the basics, the basics, and you build from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out and to everyone joining us online. We appreciate it. Um, on behalf of Lifetime Learning and the Alumni Association, we have a gift for you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much. Dean you. Hudson, for speaking, give, giving us all this great information. Um, we'll be here next week, so everyone join us again and enjoy the game. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.